So um, I'm going to dovetail some of what uh, Deloria shared from my experience working in community health centers and developing a variety of materials. And I don't think I'll have a problem with the 10 minute frame. I hope I don't speak too quick, um, being the New Yorker that I am. Um, so, you know, we've gone from my pyramid to my plate. And what I've learned through the series of uh, dietary guidelines and how we digest that information is that the patients and the populations I talk to speak food. They don't speak calories, they don't speak saturated fat, and I need to meet them where they are with their food. And so, you know, when we're thinking of nutrition education messages, they re even among similar cultural groups, um, we have to be careful that it's not one size fits all. Caribbean Latinos could be uh, Puerto Rican, they could be uh, Dominican, or they can be uh, Colombians that live on the Caribbean uh, coast. But the food varieties are very different between those three groups. Food choices, as I said, vary by region and among ethnic groups. Um, and as we all know, we learn our eating behaviors from family, culture, society. Um, and what we've learned a lot where I practice is that people don't often understand that plate because their plates don't look like a circle necessarily. It might be a triangle, it might be a rectangle, there may not be forks, it might be foods that you consume with your hands. And that most of us um, eat combination foods. And so when you're trying to provide nutrition education and you're eating things like soups and casseroles um, and mixed foods, they often don't fit into that clean uh, approach to teaching nutrition education. So I'm just gonna share some slides about uh, different Latin, Latin American groups. I practice and we, we target a lot of Latino groups, um, West Africans, and we have an, a, gr a growing uh, population of Southeast Asians and West Indian groups. And really, we've had to take a step back and learn about who our populations are and what their food behaviors are and ask a lot of questions before we start teaching. Um, so, you know, as you all know, Latin America consists of North America, Central America, Caribbean, and, and South American populations. And those populations are very different across the board and from what foods they consume. And so as we know, if a lot of our data originally came from Latinos who were of Mexican descent and uh, a big staple of their foods is corn and beans. But if you look at South American, it's potatoes, corn, and rice. And if you look at Caribbeans, it's a lot of starchy root vegetables, um, rice as well. So there are a lot of overlap and similarities, but to Dolores's point, um, when you're looking at their plates, whole grains are often not there. And it doesn't mean it can't be integrated, but I think there has to be an acceptance of what they're consuming and how they can balance their consumption um, with the foods they're already consuming before we start promoting new foods, I would suggest. Um, this is very tiny and I do apologize, but this we did as a series of focus groups when we developed our own version of my plate to target Caribbean Latinos, um, our African American population and our West African population. And so we learned um, a lot about what their meals consisted of um, and also the different dialects. Uh, so calabasas, pumpkin, it's also auyama and learning about what people call different foods, um, even though they're all speaking the Spanish language, and when they consume those different foods. When I'm getting hungry, just thinking of them. <laughs> uh, similarly, one of my biggest passions, and you know, I've learned from the mentors that I work with, is that just because we translate something doesn't mean we've interpreted it. And I think that's something really to be mindful of across the board. Translation doesn't mean interpretation. And I think that if we don't get it right, we lose people when we just try to translate. And we also spend a lot of money on it. And I've also learned that the, the least amount of paper, and I think many who are educators, um, but that the, the paper that we give is gold and it means something, um, goes a long way. Also, if it's very visual. And so this is just showing you, you know, different words for similar foods across um, Mexican Central America, uh, uh, Mexico Central America, Caribbean foods, uh, South America. So squash, like I said, is calabaza, auyama, sap sapoyo. Um, 
corn, is elote, maiz, asado, marzolca. And so sometimes we lose people if they don't recognize what we're trying to tell them is part of their package or what can be integrated because they don't recognize the words that we chose to describe a food that is quite common. <clears throat> and this goes through the same. And so I come from a practice where I focus on disease management. I'm a certified diabetes educator, um, and I do MNT uh, several times a week. And so um, I'm often in the position to try to understand what my participants are eating, but also to enhance their skill set in what they need to modify because of an illness. And before I can even teach them about an illness, I want to know what they already understand. So I think there are a lot of opportunities in the WIC population to teach our participants more. They might have a wheat allergy, but they may not understand what that is when you do a recall. And um, they might think they're not eating wheat because they, they only thought whole wheat bread was wheat and they're eating you know, some uh, whole, uh, whole wheat pasta and it has um, you know, wheat in it. Or you know, they might have a lactose uh, intolerance, um, but they hear all this about whole you know, uh, Greek yogurt and now they're consuming yogurt, not realizing that maybe they should possibly be avoiding yogurt. And so um, I think we're in an opportunity to teach and educate, but also validate and accept that a lot of our populations come to us with um, a lot of rich, nutritious foods in their diets. And I think that people are open to adopting new things if we teach them in the right way and we provide them with good resources that helps enhance whether it's they're learning English and they're learning what diabetes is or a wheat allergy is as they go to the supermarket, excuse me, um, and they try to purchase those foods. So it's a combination of what their cultural foods allow and what they are used to, and some of their cultural foods they're no longer able to eat in this country because they're just too expensive. So what we've learned is that we have our, our little bag of tricks with how we teach nutrition education um, as RDs, as health educators, as CDEs. So hand portions and the serving spoon. And some of our patients, many of our patients, don't use measuring cups. So they use a mug or the ladle that's known as the cucharón um, in many Spanish ki kitchens. Uh, when you are introducing recipes that they're simple, um, if you have the opportunity to give supermarket tours or virtual tours, that's, that's been really helpful. Um, years ago, I used to do food tastings with just focused on vegetarian cooking, not trying to make converts of my patients, but showing them that they could integrate new foods in simple ways. Um, years ago, I had a patient who had really high blood sugars, and we were trying to figure out why, and though he spoke whatever language he spoke, he didn't read. And so for a while, I didn't understand why things weren't gelling until we won on Google and we figured out what he was really eating and drinking. Um, we've gone on foot into our neighborhood and figured out what's being sold and um, developed ways to teach people who have limited reading and health literacy how to navigate their supermarkets, um, either with a flyer or creating a mock flyer. Um, and we share this res with residents and, and uh, medical students as well who work in our free clinics. Um, and, and back to my earlier point, uh, that it's not just translation, but the interpretation, that we're using simple words and short sentences, um, and that you know, we're using visuals that connote maybe some kind of emotion or an, a reaction so that if we're speaking with groups that we may not uh, fully understand their language, that they can understand what we're trying to convey through images that are pretty apparent. Um, and I said this already, and I think I'm done. Thank you.